gives a hand with these chairs. These are sa these are sacred chairs. <laughs> well, I'm excited to have them here to visit. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty surprised that I haven't lost one of them on the way here. I mean, these feel pretty safely tied down to me. We've got a little spider who's come to visit. <laughs> I think there's probably, there's a lot. I had to tip some, I, I, had, to, I had to get rid of a lot of creatures actually, because it's been in a hedge for a few months. There we go, look. Days. I know. Everybody's doing them. Yeah. <laughs> I have actually cleaned them, just yeah, in case you're wondering about the cleanliness. Look at that. Today I've brought my appalling chairs to the outskirts of London to a lovely farm building uh, to interview a guy who's, I would say, definitely the best known car YouTuber out there. One of the very first, in fact, and inadvertently one of the most controversial. Um, this is Shmi, aka Tim Burton. This is Idle Chat. I'm Johnny Smith. Welcome to The Late Break Show. If someone had just woken up from a, a very long coma and they had no idea who you are tell them what you're what you do what your what's your job from the very beginning because so, even now social media is still so much in its infancy that a lot of people don't quite understand what this is i mean effectively my job is filming and creating content about the automotive world we have the tagline living the supercar dream i'm very lucky to have now a collection of nice cars to feature the content around them, the ownership experiences, test drives, traveling, road trips, um, and sharing effectively my passion with an audience that, that are coming along for the journey. Now, I remember meeting you and filming a fifth gear item, M meeting you for the first time, was it 2013? I think it was summer 2013, yeah, because I was already out and about, basically running around London chasing cars, yeah. sticking my camera up the exhaust <laughs> as best as possible, as so many people do now. But the crazy thing is, when I did it back then, it was a handful of us. We all knew each other. Yeah. And it wasn't a mass public thing. I Instagram had only existed for a year or two. Yeah. Well, it hadn't existed. When I started, that didn't exist. No, I don't think it, it had existed. It was to post pictures on web forums, static pages, to share them with friends. And I remember when we were trying to organise the feature on Fifth Gear and the producers told me, you're going you're gonna to shadow a guy who's a supercar paparazzi yes that was the phrase back the then. sort Super of the car phrase paparazzi. Car paparazzi. So, yeah and I was like what what's this about what I was this? a bit confused I was I guess I, I'm from the more traditional kind of old school um, 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 car journalist world and we'll get on to that in a bit because um, I just didn't fully understand it I was like what so is it like sort of train spotting meets the glamorous world of, of, of fast cars sexy sexy cars predominantly in cities where more money is and that kind of stuff and where people want to show off a bit more. And I, so I didn't really know what, I didn't really understand it. And then I've looked back through the footage and we'll put a bit up. So I, I was doing a review, it was, it was a, a loosely cloaked way of reviewing a Renault Zoe, which at the time was a really early electric car, I guess. Yeah. I, I got a Zoe in to come and meet you in one today. But the reality is I couldn't fit the chairs, I couldn't fit both <laughs> chairs into a Zoe. I tried, I got one, yeah. couldn't get both. And I thought, mission aborted, I've, I've got to bring both chairs. Oh, well. So I couldn't bring a Zoe. Um, but yeah, that was the start of it. And, and when I look back, it said, Tim Burton, 120,000 subscribers on was YouTube. Was that it back then? Yeah. Wow. And I've looked, and because uh, you know, obviously before coming to meet you, 4,200 videos. You've done more than 4,200 videos in just, just over 10 years. So that's just on the one channel as well. I've got multiple channels, videos that are no longer there as well. Um, I think I've done, since I started in January 2010 was when I first uploaded on, on my YouTube channel. In the 11 and a half years since, I've done on average more than a video a day. More than a video a day? On average. Oh my word. How, how did cars come into your life? Te take me back to like you being a kid <laughs> yeah uh, and to that end actually when I looked at the old fifth gear video you still look the same you've got some Peter Pan thing going on <laughs> I have most definitely aged and I'm going to blame it on children if I can but you, you, you still look the same as you did yeah 
we would be going on a family trip to go visit grandparents, whatever it might be, and I would be shouting out the names of every car that would come the up in the other direction. You know, it was the challenge going up the M1 or whatever to name every single car, or going with my dad to different events, sitting down to watch Top Gear or Fifth Gear as a, as a family, those kind of things. Who in your family then, what cars can you remember when you were young? Like, who had the cool stuff? I mean, so, so my dad always had some pretty cool cars. He always loved his M's and AMG's. Okay. So we had an E55 AMG estate. Did he? Right yeah, which is, that's pure cool. That is cool. <laughs> Absolute cool. And M3s, um, I think probably the very first car I ever drove myself was my dad's E46 M3. Really? Just in, just in the driveway, not out the road, but just parking it up, you know, when he'd come back yeah. uh, from work at the time. And it, I, I guess it was always there. I was never really around supercars. What did you study at college and universities? Did, you know, <laughs> when, when, you, when you had this idea of like, I'm, I've, I've got to get a job, I've got to start a career. Obviously, I want to buy a nice car at some point. What, where, where, where were you with all of that? So I always thought I was going to, as I did actually work in the, the financial industry. Um, at school, I was the guy who did maths, further maths, physics, IT, computing, did... all of those subjects. Those were my five A-levels. Wow. So I was full on with the subjects that you would think would lead into that industry. And I, and I started doing a degree um, in computing. Um, which I didn't finish because I'd already entered the world of work actually before going to university and it just frustrated me. Yeah. So I was lucky that I managed to get uh, back, into, back into the world of work and, and have a job in an investment consultancy. Um, but I actually think a big part of that has led into what I do now because my role was looking at spreadsheets, studying data, and that's so much of what I did in the early years on YouTube to work out what works and what am I having success with and trying to reverse engineer the algorithm that's interesting because that was yeah. going to be one of my things yeah. so do you think that y you've analyzed what people like or what videos yeah. of yours seem to go down well i think it's much more of a business mentality than most people realize i think being successful on youtube of course you have to have a degree of creativity yeah. for making the content that you're making you have to be entertaining you have to have people that want to watch the content you're you're creating but you can significantly maximize your chances of success on the platform by understanding what you need to create, by publishing it in a very effective manner, and by effectively catering to the desires of the algorithm and the, the desires of the masses who are watching. Yeah. So a lot of what I've done has always been that more business angle than just making the videos. And when was that straight away that you did that? Yeah, from the beginning. It was, definitely. So it's been a decade of, yeah. um, of treating I, I've it as a business. Been, yeah, I've always been very, don't don't get me wrong, it's, it's very much a passion, um, but it's, it's often, I mean, uh, my, my dad sometimes references that what I do now is, yes, of course I love cars, but cars are the means to running the business. Yeah. And, and it's, it's come together. And it's, it's three things I love, cars, technology, and cameras. I think, it, like with anything in the world, when you enjoy it, you don't mind if you're doing it 16, 17 hours a day, every day. Because your w work ethic, I've known about your work ethic, behind the scenes because it's remarkable. I mean, <laughs> there are certainly times when I just can't believe that you have any time off <laughs> or even There's sleep no for thing. any great, because t do you do it all yourself still or is it, because I can't, un I from someone that now works on YouTube myself, I don't know how you do it. I honestly don't know how you do it. Or of the videos on my channel, probably 200 odd I didn't edit. Is that all? But, but pretty much everything else I did. Um, with, the, with the introduction of this space, um, it's changing and I have more of a team involved now. Yeah. I've decided now is the time to you know, try and take what I do a little bit forwards and almost to give myself a bit more time. Yeah. Because you know, for so many years, I think it's very easy to get caught up in something you enjoy to this extent because all of a sudden you don't want a holiday. You want to go on the next press drive or you want to go film the next video yeah i don't want to sit on the beach <laughs> so yeah. i haven't done for a very long time and i think the certainly in the last six seven eight years the longest i've gone without a video i think was two days seriously yeah even when even when there's been technical problems or car problems no, we go flat out through the night if i have to i only put a video out once a week and for me that's quite stressful at times so i i genuinely don't know how you 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 turn over what you turn over and but, like you said, if you've treated it like a business, you have quite a set style that you've adhered to. Yeah. I, I have very much um, this, I guess, 
format that is, is quite repetitive for sure, but I think in a way that's what people enjoy because they know what they're going to see. Yeah. You know, they load the video and it's not a surprise. Not, not, not in a bad way, I hope, but in, in a kind of... Yeah, it's not a shock. Yeah, it's not a yeah. shock what, what, what the, the viewing is. And that means when you load, let's say, a video on the Shmi 150 channel, you're expecting that yes. next 15 minutes or whatever, of the kind of video that you're going to see. Yeah. Whether that's the test drive format that I'll do, or whether that's the buying experience, let's say, of one of the cars. Um, it's, it's also much easier from the, the planning side. It's, yeah. it's that I know, you know when, I, when I pick up a camera to start filming a video, I have in my head exactly what that video is going to look like. I'm kind of editing it as I film. You know, in the back of my head, I'm making the notes. Is that because, because you're editing it most of the yeah. time? Yeah, and I, I do write notes while I'm filming. I'm, every day when I'm, when I'm out filming, I write notes of exactly, effectively storyboarding it as I go. Now, you say you're interested in technology, but the one thing that I remember always fascinated me is when you mentioned the tech that you use on yes. your channel. Now, I don't know if you can get one. Have you got one here that you can this grab? This is where I can go and run and get you there. Can you, can you, can you do it? <laughs> Bear with me one second. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna run and get this. I go. I have to confess, I didn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this was this was on the side of the wall when I when I drove in, and you've just said I storyboard everything. I think, please don't tell me that is your storyboard. <laughs> that would be brilliant. I mean, that is how the video start. But do you know what? This is actually a really interesting thing on its own is the whole Shmi versus Tim thing. Yeah. And that's, that's a very, I think, fascinating topic that a lot of people don't understand. But effectively, when this comes out, it's time to be Shmi, and the yep. video begins. Well, I'm gonna wheel this out the way and we'll carry on. <laughs> right, show me this. Handycams, this is what I started using. So back when I was a teenager, I used to trade all sorts of bits and pieces online and buy and sell everything I could pretty much. And I bought myself a mini DV camera, yeah. which was where effectively my YouTube channel began because it was something about this big, had a tape, ripped it to the computer, edited, uploaded on YouTube. Yeah. We're talking maybe 2005, 2006, Google videos and then YouTube because that of course was Of course YouTube was 06, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. But I've always stuck with this kind of format, something very easy. You know, my channels aren't about premium TV-like content. Yeah. It's about the experience and sharing where we are, what's happening. So having something that is easy to use, but also attainable for the person watching. You know, they could grab one of these and, and film the video has always been a big part of it. And even this camera, this particular model, I would reckon this probably came out in about 2013. I have a stockpile of them. Um, I buy it, them on eBay. I've got a whole true? bunch. Yeah, I genuinely have like 10 of these. So you've got backups of backups yeah, of backups. Because they'll go out one day. And what's it's, the model? Can I see the model? <laughs> it's a Sony PJ810. It's the simplicity of it. Yeah. It's this signature style. Turn on the camera, hold it up like this. Out you don't have space. anything other than your hand. No, you don't I have just a, do this. Really? Just do this. And I have my kind of techniques for moving around and making it work. If we, if we re rewind back, um, in 2013, that, that year seems to come up a lot right now, was a really, really significant year for me in the evolution of everything I'm doing. But for example, I'll never forget the, the Geneva Motor Show that year. It was a big one. Ferrari presented the LaFerrari, McLaren presented the production P1. Yeah. Um, Porsche stayed away with the 918 for that show, but there was a lot, of, lot else on, on, on display. But for example, Ferrari themselves revealed the LaFerrari on the stage. I'm holding this up above people's heads to try and film everything I can of it, while my laptop is with my friend sitting in uh, a hospitality suite with an internet connection ready and raring to go with a sequence open. I run from filming the LaFerrari at the end of the reveal, run across there, copy the files as quickly as possible, edit them together as fast as I can. My video goes online, and it's online before any other content in the world of the LaFerrari. Do you think you're quite misunderstood I think professionally? I'm, I think professionally in the industry, what I do is very misunderstood. Yeah. I think a lot of people firstly don't understand, as I mentioned, this difference between Shmi and Tim. Yeah. 
And I think a lot of people don't understand that I'm not just, let's say, some guy who got given a whole load of cars who occasionally makes a video because it's fun. It's totally the other way around. Every car has a business plan and the videos we intend to shoot with it. Back when I was buying the, the McLarens, I had a run of McLarens in a row. I had a 12C, then a 650S Spider, then a 675 LT Coupe, then the 675 LT Spider. And if I was completely chasing the business, I would have bought an Aventador and just revved it and made lots of flames. But that, and, and that it was caught fire, possibly. But that was never me. You know, my private life is off video. We, yeah. we calculate what we share and we choose what we want to share. Yeah. Well, when I introduced you and said you're sort of inadvertently controversial, you, you, <laughs> you, you, I don't think you've ever set out to be controversial at all. No. Um, and I think that's, that's almost one of the things that makes you controversial is that people... Yeah. We would, we'll talk, we've got to talk about the whole the trolling thing because anyone that does anything on the internet is wide open to oh, yes. criticism. But I think you get an absolute tsunami of... <laughs> and I, honestly, I, I want to know how you deal with it because I don't think I've ever seen you rise to it. No. So you might have the thickest skin But this is, again, they're insulting Shmi. It's, it's not me. Okay. If so, okay, yes, if somebody's met me personally and hates me, then fine, we, you know, I can't change that, that's life. We, we didn't get on for whatever reason. Yeah. But I do this because I love cars and I love what I do. Yeah. And it's, it's really fun. And like you say, sometimes things I'll have done have encouraged or, or created controversy. It wasn't intentional, it's, it's, it's a side effect. And I think this is partly as well where being one of the first and one of the largest in this world almost creates that because yeah. everybody loves the underdog kind of thing and it means a newer fresher face is always more exciting than me sure yeah i've made five thousand videos you know well, you're like I'm, the godfather i'm now, never gonna look i'm never gonna be a new person in this world i've done nearly a billion views on youtube now <laughs> have you <laughs> yeah it's about 900 million you're like a car kardashian <laughs> <laughs> like you said i worked out a long time ago that it's very easy when somebody writes a comment that you hate or gets under your skin you just want a keyboard warrior and smash out something back at them yeah and sometimes maybe write it just don't send it if somebody is writing you something, I hate your face, I want to punch you, if I, like, if I saw you in the street, I'd tell you what I think of you, that kind of thing. You just have to think, you have no context on that person's position. Yeah. Have they had a really bad day? Has something happened in their life? You know, are they just taking out their anger because it's the easy way to do it? Mm. And you know, maybe they have, and you know, that's their way to vent. So you can't take it personally because you don't know what's happened on the other side. I can't believe how, how, how nice you are about it. Because <laughs> I remember you were like this a few years ago when, when we were, was it the Aston Martin? The Rapid E. The Rapid Electric yeah. thing, yeah. And you were, and I was thinking, how can you be so calm <laughs> when there's so many people like trying to throw stones at you? And in it's fact, not. to that end, do you want to dispel any myths? There, there are, there there are shmi myths out there. You know, there are people that make huge assumptions about you. There are tons. Well, give me a top. Give I mean, me a top the the, the main thing is, you know, my dad must have bought all my cars for me. That's, yeah. that's the like number one that goes on the internet. Um, we must own this, that, and the other business, and I must be a billionaire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, I, I make no secret that I did have a good upbringing. I went to a good school. Uh, I was lucky to travel a fair bit. My dad, as I said earlier, had a couple of nice cars in the garage here and there. No supercars, but nice premium German vehicles. Um, and I I got to to learn a lot. Um, but that's very different from being given everything. You know, yeah. My dad was an accountant, taught, I was counting my pocket money as a very little kid, <laughs> like in spreadsheets. I was on it from like really? seven years old. I had a spreadsheet when I was seven to wow. manage my pocket money, my 50p a week, whatever it was I still 25 years ago. I still don't understand <laughs> spreadsheets. It's quite, <laughs> quite embarrassing. So that, that's what lined me up basically for the, the very mathematical, I guess, studies and then, and then start of my career. Yeah. Um, but even when I bought my first sports car, which is now back in the garage behind me, my Aston Martin Vantage Roadster. That one? Yeah. Yeah. But when I bought that back in 2010, I, I, I put in a 20 grand deposit. I was working in the city at that point, you know, and was in a position that I could pay the 750 pounds a month on the finance or whatever it was. And I built up the deposit um, as a, I guess, single young 20s professional. So I got myself into that position. How old were you when you bought that? 23. 23. But that's because of not having completed a university degree, having already been doing stuff on YouTube in the background, which had started earning a small amount, all the trading things I'd done before as a teenager. Yeah. And I started trading online as about when I was 14 on eBay. Did you? I was selling all my school friends' old mobile phones and whatever I could find. Really? It's got anything I could sell. You were an eBay trader? Quits. Yeah. 
So I, I, I got into to eBay stuff at, at a pretty well young age. I think you probably were supposed to be 18 to trade on eBay. But anyway, 14 year old might have changed my date of birth. <laughs> so you used to flog other people's stuff, literally, mostly yeah. tech. Mostly tech, because it's what I was into. Yeah. And if you think about it, that period through the mid 2000s was very much a new phone came out every two weeks. Yeah. So mobile phones were the big one because color screens would come in, cameras would come in, and things were evolving so fast that everybody around me was getting new gadgets all the time. And you know, I would say, hey, your phone that you've had for 12 months is worth 100 quid. Rather than throwing it away, let me sell it for you and I'll keep 20, 30 pounds, whatever it might have been. You know, I, I, I well know and I appreciate that I had a good upbringing but I didn't exactly have my dad buying me a car. In fact, my dad doesn't think I should have any of these cars. Really? Maybe one. He thinks it's very financially irresponsible. Does he? <laughs> yes. So, so believe me, the last thing he would do is buy me a supercar. Does he still have nice cars or is he- Yeah, actually I convinced him. So uh, sadly, my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago and it was, it was then that I convinced my dad to spend a little a bit of what he inherited onto a, a V12 Vantage. Really? So this was perhaps, a bad thing for me to have done because it all of a sudden made the whole internet think that I must be being given my cars <laughs> because my dad suddenly had an Aston Martin. You know, I think it was maybe eighty thousand pounds for a V two Vantage. Yeah. Expensive, but not like not silly. Yeah, yeah. You know, not Good crazy quality. money. When you buy one, do you buy a car outright or do you finance it? No, I have it, a complete you... mixture. Um, this is something that, that you know a lot of people talk about. I, I have a complete mix. Some cars I own outright. Some cars I financed. Some cars I might own outright at first and then take out financing against them. Some I might have had financing and paired off, vice versa. It, it just depends on what's right at the time. And you know, with financial investments, and I'm not you know I'm not qualified to give investment advice, but <laughs> every person is in a different scenario. But also every yeah. period of year is in a different scenario, and there might be an opportunity that's too good to miss. Yeah. But at that moment in time, you don't have the capital available. Whereas on the flip side, take the AMG GT Black Series. I know I'm keeping it. I know I want to do a lot with it. I'm going to literally respray it, change the color. Yeah. I'm going to take it around the world. So I bought it outright because it means it's mine to do what I want to do with it. Yeah. Um, whereas a car like, say, the Ford GT, I know now I'm going to be keeping it, but I'm not going to be using it so much going forwards. It's you know slightly retired from the front line, we could say. Yeah. So we're looking at opening up a, a refinancing package against it because it makes sense to be able to free up some capital to use for other things for with an asset that is very safe. It's just going to be, you know, secured in my collection long term. So, so you're always looking at the value yeah. of them now with yeah, what, you're, what you're looking to do. Again, it's it's business planning. You okay. know, I think it's like any any business would look at things in a traditional industry. A company wants to have serviceable debt. Having debt means you can use money to go further. Yeah. What you don't want, obviously, is to be in a position where you can't repay it. Yeah. But it's good to take on some debt when you can use that money to, to earn larger, larger rates on whatever it might be that you're doing. So when you drive around, obviously, you've got number <laughs> plates which all say Shmi. Yeah. By the way, are they expensive plates or are they quite cheap? No, they're, they're the normal DVLA issue. Are they? And I've got, I bet you've got loads of I them. have so many of them. How many? Because there, there are some I don't own, and people reach out and say, you know, I'll sell you this plate for insert some dreamland number. And it's Did like, you? no. No, because I've got 30 others. <laughs> yes. I've so got you, more stock, you stockpiling. I stockpiled them all and was like, I'm done. Tell me about your guilty pleasures, cars. <laughs> look, you, know, you can tell me about other guilty pleasures, but so <laughs> cars I, 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 look, I know the Clio's the first car. You, there's the Subaru Leone. Yeah, you've seen that, the Subaru Leone. We didn't have them over here. No. That was, that was a funny one. So because I had done a whole load of business things as a teenager and, and I had done things like I used to build computers and sell them and reselling mobile phones online. And yeah. I actually, when I left school, because I was doing so much at the time importing electronics from the Far East, I would bring in mobile phones from Hong Kong or Japan and deal with all the, uh, the, the paperwork and that was a massive headache. I'm sure really? it probably still is. Yeah, I used to do this in a big way. I went into a shop in London at one point and said, could I get 100 European to UK uh, adapters? And they looked at me like, why does some 18 year old want 100? <laughs> Well, yeah. maybe I was 19 at the time, 100 of those. And I was like, this is what I do. I import lots of stuff. And they said, would you like to rent part of the shop? You know, would you like to do this from a shop? So I actually took on the lease for a shop on Tottenham Court Road in London, which was electronics capital at the time. It's not, not yeah. so much anymore. That's right. Um, and kind of grew a, a bit of a business selling on eBay, but with the shop presence, which I suppose legitimized everything online back then. It made you more, you know, more, well, literally legitimate. Yeah. Um, I only did that for a short period. Somebody took over the business from me, gave me a really easy exit. So myself and two friends then went with my Clio 
to France for a couple of months to learn to be ski instructors. And then I went to New Zealand to be a ski instructor. Hence the, hence Subaru. the Subaru Leon. So we wanted a car in New Zealand and that cost me 700 pounds, I remember. And it was one of my favorite cars ever because it did everything. In a world where, I mean, I've seen a lot of the all cars you buy new or, yeah. ne or nearly new, there's not a great deal of classics. Is this a personal thing of like, you, you prefer the new thing? Or is it, are you gonna ever dabble with? And I've seen more and more people going down the sort of car collections with classics. Mm. And I know you've owned, you've owned a Mini, a Rover Mini. Yep. I don't know what year it was, 90s? Very end, 2001. It was one of the last. Yeah. So that's probably the last classic I think of you of owning, I guess you call yeah. it a classic. Like we said, I personally very much enjoy the journey. I enjoy being part of a car from the beginning, yeah. seeing it being revealed, knowing one's coming, the weight going through the spec process yeah. and knowing everything about it. So pretty much every car in what I would call my permanent collection, I've had from new. I think else like the LT, the GT8, Senna, Ford GT, etc. I got to go through that whole process and it, it makes a car so much more special for me personally because I know everything about its story yeah. but also I think for the channel and my audience because they get to come along for that journey as well mm. I think a lot of people have this assumption that I must despise classics because I don't have any but it's it's not that it's just that I really enjoy this era of technology I would also love a 60s Mustang would you they're just cool I mean I have a bit of a Ford thing going on with the GT the Focus RS and the GT500 new yeah. Mustang but I'd love a classic Mustang of sorts would you ever do the resto mod thing? Like a brand new old you know, car, effectively? I would. I think this is the direction we're heading in a big way anyway. Yeah. That even old cars, you know, we've seen Singer and the likes of Porsches and different models. But I, I almost quite like the idea of an old car that's an EV. When did it go from just you to Shmi, the brand employing people? When did a long you? time ago. Right. Long before anybody would realise. I think probably before we even filmed that episode, 2013. Really? I think around 2012 was about the time I started working with a friend who's now business manager of the brand, um, who had more of a journalistic background. So right. he'd worked in the, in the tech world, mobile phones mostly, and had that understanding of the journalism space, I guess, and how press launches worked. What I do is very different to what a lot of other people do, even within my space. Yeah. But if you're not in that space, you don't see it. You just see a thumbnail on a YouTube front page and you think these two are the same. Yeah. So that's one of the things that has made it certainly, I would say, harder from my side, from the other people in our industry, perhaps wanting to just shut a door on me because I, I can't know anything. But, you know, I, I'm very lucky at this stage to have now driven a lot of cars. You know, even though I haven't had decades of experience of test driving cars, I found myself behind the wheel of pretty much every supercar on the market and do have an opinion now on you know how these things stack up and mm -hmm. as a customer of the cars as well because of going through that process so it's 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 been a funny one for me because there have been times where you know i grew up reading auto car and evo you know and watching the tv shows so I, it's really cool to have met so many of the people, <laughs> case in point, yeah. who, I, who, I, who I've watched over. You've driven more like, supercars than me, over, without over a doubt. Um, and in some cases, it's been quite disheartening that they might have put a cold shoulder to me because I guess I'm the threat, I'm the, the new generation. Yeah. But it's different because I'll show the information and experience of a car, but I don't know how to talk about what it's like sliding it at Mach 10. You know, the yeah. full on, I'm not there yet. Maybe I will get there in five, 10 years. I know I'm not there. And in the earlier days, I kept it more to just showing how things worked. Yeah. Or if you put this car into a different mode or flip the Manatino on the Ferrari steering wheel, what happens? Yeah. I kept it more to the information yeah. side and less so the critical review because I knew I didn't have that experience on which to, to, to you know, qualify myself yeah. to give that opinion. Yeah. Um, so like I say, it was, it was a little bit disheartening at times that people would shut me out because they thought maybe that I thought I knew more than they did. What cars do you not like? What cars do I not like? Yeah, because you, I, I know you're, you're, you're too nice to probably call <laughs> people out, but honestly, what do you not really not, not into? I can tell you one that's a bit of a curveball. Yeah. I never really got 911s. I see you a bit as like Switzerland during the war. 
very, <laughs> very neutral. Yeah. They're there, they're nice. Um, they go about their business in a certain way. And the reason why I say that is because w- 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 one of the cameramen uh, who's here, Graham, said, you seem to be able to collaborate with a lot of other YouTubers yep. in different countries and stuff, and you're allowed in. And you can go and collaborate with X and then go straight to Y, who X has had a beef with at some point, <laughs> but you're, you're Switzerland, you're neutral, you can just do that, and they're all right with it. It's you seem to glide between these other content creators without... It's because I'm here for a passion and a positivity and not the drama. And I think, I think there's so much good you can do with this kind of position. Of course, I'll never swear on a video, nothing like that. I'll make You've never sworn on a video. I've never seen you be angry. <laughs> do, you, do you ever get angry? Of course, we all get angry. Well, this you... is one of the things about the character thing, right? Yeah. If Tim is having a really bad day, yeah. and you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I had a day where I had spent the whole night uh, basically not sleeping because I had been with, with somebody very close to me uh, unwell in hospital. Right. I hadn't gone to bed and at 9 a.m. I was filming again. But split it, separation, camera's back on, yeah. let's not deal with that. Um, do you have any hobbies outside of cars? Yeah. Like what do you do? Do you get stressed? Do you, do you find relaxing? Do you make, you know, do you make candles? Do you, uh, <laughs> do you dream about building a pond like I do? Well, uh, when, I, when I was younger and doing all of my skiing, I used to crochet hats. Did you? Believe it or not, I don't do that anymore. Did but you? you made really? a couple. Yeah. I forgot to ask you this at the beginning. Where did the Shmi 150 name <laughs> come from? Funny story. When I was in single digits, when I was about nine years old, my brother and I together made up the nickname Shmi to sign up for a website. <laughs> Once upon a time, I went to sign up for a website and it said Shmi was already taken. Oh. Would you like Shmi 9999, Shmi 12345, Shmi 0011 or whatever, or yeah. Shmi 150? And because it was the shortest, I clicked Shmi 150 and that was that. That's it? Yep, that's so where it's a made up from. name when you were like nine? Yep, and it became my Sega Dreamcast online name, my PlayStation name, my MSN username, you know, for MSN Messenger. Yeah. It became my login for everything, of course. And when I then created the YouTube channel, I didn't make my YouTube channel to upload car videos. I made my YouTube channel as a way of hosting the mini DV tape footage I was ripping from my camera to my laptop of, let's say, at school, my friends playing rugby or whatever it might be. My gosh. I was literally, or, or um, you know, we would make, as I think everybody probably does now as youngsters, we would make funny videos together. We would try and create little yeah. stories and make short videos, and I would just upload them on, on DV tape. Yeah. What would you say to those people who think you only buy cars for likes? I think, I, I can understand it, because I know there are a lot of people in my space that do, who yeah. will just buy a new Lamborghini just to get a bunch of traffic on it. And to confess, when I bought my first AMG GTR, yeah. I ordered it before we knew it was gonna be called the GTR or anything, just it, it was going to be a, potentially the Black Series, the hardcore version of the GTS. Yeah. A part of me then was doing it because I wanted to get more into the Mercedes AMG audience, a very big audience with so many different cars. So it was, you know, calculated if I buy the flagship AMG model, hopefully that's gonna, you know, open up a new audience. It then just happened that I really liked the car and used it a lot and went on to buy a few more of them. A few more, <laughs> it's amazing. And remember that sometimes the algorithm is out of your control. You can't choose how many views a video gets. The recipe's changing all the time. All the time all the time and i i'm exhausted trying to ru- trying to run i spend it. an hour probably every single day trying to understand algorithms looking wow. at stats every day every morning first thing i do when i wake up do you wish it wasn't just you on the camera as in on yes, the screen regularly because and obviously is, you your channel is you yeah and it always has been in it and i tried a few years ago to introduce other characters into the videos but if you look at the stats you can see that the audience doesn't engage with it the average retention time would collapse people would skip the segments that had other people in them it just didn't work because if you load a video you know if you load a channel like mine if you load a channel like let's say doug demuro or something you know what you're going to get you know what's in that content so you can't deviate from it and we actually have a new channel for here for the museum which some of the team who are working here are involved in as well. Yeah. And that is a bit of a way for me to dial back some of the pressure, to yeah. not be the front of everything. Um, I would love it if it's possible to be able to, you know, not be in a few videos, to be able to go sit on what, a beach. Like go somewhere. away for a weekend <laughs> yeah. and turn your phone off. Yeah. Do you do that actually? Because mentally, 
I this is a, this can be a real pressure cooker environment. There is a lot of pressure. When you're in a world where you don't have your video for tomorrow and you need to film something in the morning and upload it same day, it's, it's a real panic. It's awful. Yeah, I you, hate you, it. You really, really, really stress yourself out. And I know we voluntarily put ourselves into this position. Yeah. You know, nobody has made us do this job. Um, nobody made me do what I do now. You know, I, I chose to pick up a camera and make videos. And, you know, when, if, you, if you're online and you ever say you're having a hard time or you're finding something difficult, people will destroy you for it yep. because how can you be so ungrateful? Yeah. It, it's, it's bizarre. You know, it's bizarre. And you see, you know, more than enough cases around the world of people who have been big on social media uh, having issues dealing with it, you know, yeah. having anxiety, having problems that have come from that position. And I'm quite happy if I drop my car off at a workshop and let's say they've got a diesel polo to run around in or something. I'm quite happy to take that. I have no problems with that. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people go, I'm so sorry, this is all we've got. I don't mind. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's refreshing under the radar. Nobody's looking at it. Yeah. You know, just drive. Maybe that's a new channel. It could be <laughs> Shmi, Shmi in a sh shit, fairly shit car. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show. Thank you for sharing the idle chat chairs with me, Tim. If you've got a comment below, feel free to leave a comment. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I've got to say that, apparently. Uh, it's good, isn't it? It's good to say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you ever so much. Mm -hmm.